Average Engineers. Today I wanted to do a quick talk about building data pipelines in Databricks. It's kind of like a 101, just a totally super high level introduction uh, to building data pipelines in Databricks, which it consists of Spark, Delta Lake, and Airflow in my case. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about it, give you guys an idea of what it looks like at a super high level. Maybe later I could do more videos where we dive into different pieces and actually write them out and do code examples. I'll show a couple screenshots. But yeah, I really just wanted to give a super high level of what it looks like to build production level pipelines in Databricks, kind of like how you would go about that at a super high level if you have never really done that before. So yeah, that's kind of what I want to talk about. Concept reality, how do we really get there? Um, I guess you can break it down to what do we need to build a reliable and production level data pipelines. Comes down to data storage, compute, transformation, and orchestration. If you think about it, we got to have somewhere to store our data, something to compute with, right? We need compute, we need CPU and memory to do what we need to do. The transformations, right? We need to do something, we need to have a tool, something we're going to do to that data, transform it, whatever. And then obviously, typically, we have some sort of orchestrator, something that will tie the entire pipeline together. So in the case of Databricks, what that looks like, is data storage is Delta Lake. If you're not familiar with Delta Lake, it's an open source project. It's heavily used by Databricks. They put a lot of work into it. Go check it out, delta.io. It's a great tool. For compute, obviously in the Databricks, they provide Databricks clusters, Spark clusters. That's the compute on the Databricks side. And they usually are on top of like AWS, GCP, Azure, right, in the background. And then for transformations, if you're on Databricks, you're either gonna be using uh, PySpark or Spark SQL most of the time. Of course, there is some Scala Spark weirdos out there, but not many of them. And then for orchestration, in this case, we're going to talk about Airflow, Airflow-esque. So maybe some people are getting Databricks workflows. They're still kind of new yet, not totally feature compliant with everything that you would expect from something like Airflow or Prefect or Dagster or whatever. So concept reality, like what does it actually look like to have a data pipeline running in Databricks. Well, obviously, data pipeline and Databricks are in the Databricks environment, which means, like we already talked about, you have Delta Lake. That's where your data is stored. That's where you push and pull your data from when you're running your pipelines. Then, obviously, you're going to be using Apache Spark to do all the hard data crunching, and then the pipeline orchestration is going to be Apache Airflow. These days, pretty much everyone has built-in operators for Databricks, so whether you're using Airflow Perfect, Dagster, Mage, whatever, pretty much everybody out there, you know, Databricks is so big, they have, if you go look at any orchestration to it, it's probably going to have like a Databricks integration to basically let you call into your Databricks environment and execute things. So let's talk about data, Delta Lake. Delta Lake, it's an open source framework, it's pretty popular. If you're not familiar with it, it provides acid and crud capabilities and what i mean by that is when you use it it'll feel very similar to using something like postgres mysql sql server kind of gives you that same feel of course it's completely different than those it's a file-based storage but it's an api on top of file-based storage parquet files usually stored in the cloud somewhere like s3 it's a great tool if you've never used it go check it out easy to use it's a great project and if you're on databricks there's a 99% chance you're probably going to be using Delta Lake to store your data and pull the data back out. What I mean by Delta Lake is similar to relational databases. If you look at it here, most people interact with their Delta Lake via SQL because it makes sense to them. A lot of data engineers have come from the Postgres MySQL place, so it just makes sense to be able to interact with your data and your Delta Lakes with SQL, and you can do that. That's one of the big attractions of Delta Lake, actually. As you can see, there's a create statement for a Delta Lake table. Pretty much looks like any other SQL you've ever seen. Column names, data types, etc. When you come to the compute uh, at Databricks, you're basically going to have two options for Databricks Spark clusters. Jobs, which are short-lived clusters. They last for, the, last for the lifetime of a job. They're cheaper. Once a job's finished, that compute goes away. And then the other option you usually have is all-purpose clusters which are those are long lived they are durable can run for a long time they don't just disappear after you use them and a lot of people use them for things like notebooks and exploration and r and d of course there's other things like sql endpoints sql warehouses things but we'll not get into that for the main part 
that you need to be worried about as a data engineer, you'll probably be using one of the two. It's important to note that the all-purpose clusters are much more expensive than the job clusters. Compute, there's two ways of usually doing that in Databricks. You can go around and click in your UI and make a cluster, right? An all-purpose cluster on the left there is what you see. And that's typically what a lot of people use for notebooks. You set up a cluster, um, you know, you can assign different size resources to it, etc. But then also, of course, Databricks is well known to have APIs for everything. So when you're a programmer and you're making programmable pipelines that are stored in GitHub and things like that, you can actually define clusters with JSON. And then, you know, you can send them to the API, Databricks API that you get with your Databricks account and create clusters for your jobs with just defined in JSON. Next, we're going to talk about transformations. So transformations is actually the code you write, which interacts with the storage you're using, the Delta Lake. And in Databricks, that's going to be done in PySpark. You can write regular Python, of course. You can write Scala Spark if you're weird, or you can write Spark SQL. A lot of people like the Spark SQL route. And there's kind of a lot of detail here that we won't get into, but at a high level, that's what you'll be doing. You see an example on the right of both some PySpark code in combination with Spark SQL. And of course, there's lots of options. You can write your code in notebooks. You can zip your files up and put them on S3 so your cluster, Spark cluster has access to them. You can, you know, have zipped code from a repo in there. You can attach repos in, from GitHub into Databricks and, you know, run that code from the repo. It's a lot of kind of choose your own adventure there, and there's a lot of complexity there, different ways you can basically deploy your code and store your code with Databricks and run it. Um, maybe we'll do some videos on some of those different options down the road. You know, you can abstract. Of course, Databricks has good, done a good job of abstracting the difficult parts of Spark away, but there is some complexity when you get into the DevOps side of, oh, I actually want to make a production level pipeline. I want to write my code in a repo, and then, you know, I want to deploy that code and actually run it on my Spark clusters, right? That's There's some stuff there, right? There's a little bit of, I wouldn't say rocket science, but it's uh, you kind of need to know what you're doing a little bit. Um, in the beginning, sure, you could just write your code in a notebook and then just attach that to a cluster and just run that from an API, from Airflow. Probably not the best thing to do if you're writing production-level code. If you have big repos, you know, you're probably stored in GitHub, things like that. And it's not terribly hard. A lot of times what you do is simply need to zip up that code. And then, you know, when you're submitting a job to run on Databricks to the API, you just kind of like reference that you know, zip files of code on S3 somewhere. It's really pretty easy, but if you've never done it before, it can be slightly confusing. And of course, last but not least is orchestration. Just like we talked about before, there's numerous Databricks operators provided by many different orchestration tools. They provide a ton of different operators to use to, you know, do all sorts of different stuff. It's just kind of, these kind of match how you decide to deploy your code, how you want to run it, right? There's a lot of detail in there kind of depending on your situation, what you want to do, how you want to run your code. For example, what you're seeing here is a, you know, what you're seeing here is a JSON representation of a Databricks job. You can see it kind of has, you know, we saw the cluster JSON config before. It's, this is the same thing for a job saying, oh, here's my cluster. Here's my Spark submit task. You know, I want you to run this file. And I want you to run this on with this code in my zip out on S3 that's got all my code in it, right? It's not too rocket science-y. Then on the right is just a Airflow DAG that's saying, you know, go ahead and use a Databricks submit run operator and just kind of submit this job to my Databricks account and run it, right? Um, there's a little bit, we're kind of glossing over some detail, but you can see it's really not that complicated. Not a lot of code. And that's kind of the power of running Databricks pipelines 101 it's pretty straightforward if you've never used the tools it can be a little overwhelming if you're not familiar with delta lake or spark you're probably going to have a harder time but if you're familiar with those tools you've used spark you've worked with big data things like delta lake you know it makes it easier another big thing that'll come in favor is any devops experience you have you know if you wanted to run pipelines from an api databricks api and you want to define your jobs in code and run them in code and trigger them via an Airflow, it's honestly pretty easy. Again, if you have Airflow experience, if you have DevOps experience, you're familiar with the writing code, you're familiar with maybe deploying code out to an S3 bucket, things like that. 
if you've done those things, then it's really not that big of a jump to be writing production data pipelines on Databricks. But I hope that kind of gives you a, a super high level of kind of what it would look like at a high level. Kind of the architecture you're looking at, the tools and the skills you might need to do this. Of course, each one of these things we talked about is worthy of their own video, but I hope that gives you guys just a general overview of what you can expect.